and uh, ghost here. Yeah. Ghost. Ghost. The Martian, Humber Bundle, right there. <laughs> Tomorrow Corporation. Ooh. Welcome, international audience. You're listening to Biertaucher Podcast, issue 226. Today uh, we have here Horst, Derek, Gregor, Dennis, Bernd, and Thomas. And we thank our sponsor. <laughs> ah, yeah, genau. Jörgkonnik.com. Ach, ja. If you're an international customer looking for an <laughs> internet agency in Austria, head over to Wukonnik.com. Mm -hmm. From which city are we recording? We're recording here live from Vienna, from the best Kurdish local in a restaurant in Vienna, from the Zypresse, Westbahnstraße 35A. Ah, Westbahnstraße 35. Hey, Westbahn Street. Yeah, Westbahn Street. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Um, West Train Street. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is uh, the English uh, issue of this podcast. Normally we uh, speak German only, but today we have a star guest, Derek Breen, uh, directly imported from United States. And so this issue is in English language. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's start. Good. Uh, we begin with just that everyone says what he wants to speak about, and then we speak about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's just make a round. Uh, I uh, begin. I want to report that I today was in an Austrian school in Vienna and did a two-hour uh, improved uh, scratch workshop. Oh. And yeah, that was it. Oh. And I spent the day at MetaLab meeting with some really cool local people who've developed a robot for children that they're um, crowdsourcing on Kickstarter. I hope you also speak about your travel to South Africa. Oh yeah, I'm happy to speak about South Africa. And you <laughs> was uh, doing a scratch workshop on Sunday with Turtle Stitch with Andrea Meyer. With you? Yeah, you could, yeah. we could both talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my topics. I wanted to see a film. <laughs> you wanted to see a film. One this good is a one. Topic and in and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the next step of podcasting. <laughs> not the, not the same films I saw, the films I wanted to see. <laughs> yeah. The one is The Martian and the other one is The Maze. The one I suppose um, can be uh, is, is very, very good and the other one not so good. But I have um, so I'm seen the first part and so let's see. And I have bought a humble bundle um, about ah. adventures and Nordic games. So my Ooh. favorite cool. genre of games. Uh, I will talk a little bit um, about Tomorrow Corporation <laughs> and I can do it now. Um, uh, look at the homepage of Tomorrow Corporation in the next day and buy it, the next game. <laughs> and uh, that's all. And the second thing is a Beginner's Guide, um, buy it, that's all. And für die nicht internationalen Gäste, <laughs> <laughs> ich war im Kino. <laughs> uh, Dennis was in the cinema. <laughs> Und habe mir, habe mir erst wieder da angeschaut. But he has seen some German film. <laughs> Very exact translation. <laughs> okay. I have no specific topic. I actually also don't have a topic, but Horst said we well, might want to talk a bit about uh, 3D programming in Python. Okay, and I can add that um, I bought um, and played today Sir, You Are Being Hunted, a uh, humble bundle game uh, mm -hmm. that you can play on Linux. Yeah. Let's start. So, let's start. So then I make it backward. Thomas, you are noted uh, Vienna game uh, developer, uh, artist, game artist and programmer. Can you um, talk about how is it to program 3D games, uh, 3D uh, graphics with Python? Oh, that's a, that's a really broad question. Um, so just say that what you want to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this this week I'm, I'm actually continuing. So, so I, I've in my free time, I'm doing some work on uh, a little 3D project in Python. I'm using uh, the Piglet library for that, which allows you to basically interface with OpenGL. Uh, I'm trying to go the hard route. That means like no Unity, no. You use no game done. engine. You really code yeah. everything yourself. Uh, which is nice because then you also get like all kinds of weird 
artifacts on the screen and weird glitches that if you would just do it in Unity, it would be like probably done in two hours or something like that if you're used to programming Unity. But uh, that's not the fun part of it. Um, yeah, so, so this week I started and at the moment failed uh, doing collision detection. So right now you can uh, walk around the landscape and there's already a... Uh, like the, the the floor or the terrain. So and you have a sweetie area where you can yeah. go like in a... Yeah, and you can, you can walk around. There is mm -hmm. actually... Uh, there you don't are, sink into the ground. You don't sink on the, into the ground because that's kind of easy to do. So basically mm -hmm. you just limit the uh, y-axis. So okay. the, the axis that goes up for me is the y-axis and uh, you don't, don't sink into the ground. You're just limited to that. So if you fall, there's already gravity so you can jump and there's gravity. But, but if you there's just, a mountain, you walk to the mountain? Or? Uh, no, you. but you can climb up the mountain as, as steep as it gets. So there's mm -hmm. no limitation and mm -hmm. you basically are a real good mountain climber and you climb really fast because you just yeah, walk up game. and ah. yeah it's it's, a, it's an Austrian game so to speak um, <laughs> and, uh, is there actually a GitHub project or something uh, not yet I, I plan see. to publish it at some okay. point but it's it's not at that okay. stage yet and yeah there are also houses already like real simple houses that look like Blocks. basically cubes and, cubes. and uh, okay. what's the name for the stretch if it's not if not the, the sides are all the same it's a stretch of cube yeah, like a rectangular... A rectangular... A, a 3D rectangle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you can have cubes and 3D rectangles and that can make up houses. And But you, you can see them, but you can still walk through them. And that's something okay. that I want to look at next. So actually you can, unlike other uh, 3D games, you can go into the houses. Yeah, kind of. But it's... <laughs> so yeah. maybe you're a ghost. Um. Yeah, you can and just always just make the gameplay description in the way that you don't have to do anything, right? Yeah. Okay. You, it's a really dark room, so you don't see anything, but it's, it's full of wonderful things. It's just very, very dark. Okay, <laughs> Black screen. Brightness. Done. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I guess that it, maybe in, in some future podcast when I've progressed some more, we can talk a bit more about that. Okay, thanks, uh, Thomas. Uh, Scratch workshop. Okay, um, I was doing a Scratch workshop in an Austrian school. Um, I was, I was, I had an appointment to do a workshop there, mm -hmm. and I was just checking if they have a good computer equipment, which is not uh, given in any school. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised they had dual boot uh, Ubuntu, Linux, and Windows. Oh. Mm -hmm. And on the Linux machines, the children know they were 15 years old. They know their password, which was actually a pseudo password, so I can install things. The internet was working and I was, I was very impressed. I said, wow, I can do a really good workshop. And then one of the uh, girls there asked me, can you do teacher's game programming now? And I said, yes, I have two hours time. You must ask your teacher. And then they said yes. And then I made a scratch workshop because I had not, nothing specific prepared and I don't wanted to improvise with the Linux. I wanted to do something simple. And I said, well, uh, for a scratch, you don't have to boot Linux. You can... Uh, stay in the windows that most of you have booted anyway mm -hmm. and you just open your browser and go to the site scratch.mit.edu and what happened uh, from I think 12 PCs around four managed to do that to go ah. to the website uh, one spontaneously uh, crashed because it was windows <laughs> and uh, another children made long faces and said yes uh, there is no flash player installed <laughs> and, and then there was some discussion uh, what that the browser and the inter really yeah and, <laughs> well so uh, i should have done the right thing and forced the whole class to boot uh, mm -hmm. linux and use uh, firefox Yes. on the Linux, so my liberalism was uh, hurting me. But what was actually the need for the Flash player? Is is there a, an online version of Scratch that runs in the Flash player? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. This is uh, the Scratch 2. This is, uh, you can uh, play it offline. Uh, it's, there's a version yeah. with offline, but then you need to install Adobe Air, which is even more complicated than install uh, Flash yeah. player. Yeah. And uh, for the usual uh, Scratch, what you just play online on the website, you just need a Flash player installed. So Scratch 2 is actually written in Flash Action Script or something? Yeah, okay. yeah. this is the, the, the bad point about it. Yeah. Is there, there any plans of, I mean, now with MScript and stuff like that, can you actually try to get yeah. it working? I've seen um, I've seen somewhat working versions in HTML5 native, so I assume that's going to be the next full version release. Yeah. 
and there are also um, uh, similar products to um, Scratch, like um, Snap. No. Yeah. Snap. Yeah. And, Snap and, and others and others who run in HTML5. Uh, and Scratch is the one with the cat, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. With the cat. So the previous uh, Scratch one was a native application, or was it? Yeah, Scratch one point four was created in Smalltalk. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Scratch one, you can easily download. Yeah. So if you have uh, to give an offline. Uh, are there are there any feature differences between two and one, or would you, would you yeah. recommend? Go yeah, on. there's there's some pretty big differences. I mean, what's interesting is Scratch 1.4 is getting, it has a resurgence because it's installed on Raspberry Pi. So if people buy Pi, then they're using the earlier version of Scratch. Scratch 2.0 is far superior for game development because in the previous version, you can't have cloning or instances. So you have to have individual sprites for every single object in the game, which is a real drag for... So you can't do like a particle system easily? Um, no, it would be incredibly time consuming to do that. Uh, and also you can't do custom blocks. You can't do procedures in the old version. So, um, and my favorite feature in the new version and part of why they originally went with Flash is ve a vector graphics engine. So being able to, to create vector graphics within Scratch is a pretty big deal uh, for animation in particular. Yeah. Also, the nice thing if you use the web version of Scratch 2 is that they continually uh, evolve. So today I discovered a new feature I was not seeing before. It was uh, cloud storage variables. So you can store a variable in a cloud on a server. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. With the with the web version, can you actually save your project and yep. load it and share it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Do you have to inbuilt. It's inbuilt. Do you have to log in or do, can you save to the local hard drive? You can save to the local hard drive without logging in. Yeah. yeah. Is there also like a community thing or where you can share it somewhere? Yeah. yeah, I mean, really, I think the most powerful feature in the online version of Scratch is the remix button. So you click one button and you have full access to all the code and can make any changes and, and share and it back out. your changes. Yeah. yeah, and it's being it's been translated into over 40 languages. So now people can natively code in their own language for the first time, which is pretty huge when you think about it. It's software for kids. But until now, all programming languages, for the most part, have been in English. Mm -hmm. And there's finally a language that allows people that aren't native English speakers to express themselves digitally. So, so that means <coughs> that the keywords are actually translated? Yeah, so all the blocks get translated into the native language and all the, the entire interface. Okay. Yeah. So if I, um, if I load an English... If, if I'm German speaking and load the English program, I actually get the keywords translated to German. Yeah. So you don't save the like the, the localized thing, but you just have like a symbol or a keyword for that, right. and I just see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not like um, Visual Basic for applications in the 90s where you can program in German uh, with German words, uh, but um, it's not possible to run the scripts uh, on an English version. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. Really yeah. Yeah. yeah, to, to conclude it, I made a zombie shooter game, uh, something that is very fun to do in our official school because I know as a official state uh, paid uh, teacher I would uh, maybe get into troubles and the kids were really excited for 15 year olds they were very brave they, I had uh, two hours uh, time they made no break uh, they, nobody was going to the toilet uh, and the kids were even uh, dis um, disciplining themselves so if I, I always ask it uh, dramatically, oh, how much time I have, if I have left, can we make hit points for the zombies? Ah, yes, we have 20 minutes left, I can show you this feature also. So mm -hmm. I was trying to show a bit off and uh, grab a lot of coding inside it. And the kid said, really, so if one uh, kid asked too many questions or made too much fun, the other kid said, no, no, be quiet. Oh, we, we, we want more code. We want, yeah. we want to use this, this <laughs> man. Teach us, uh, teach us more. And then there was, um, at the end, uh, the, of course, the teacher was also impressed, which was my goal. And then the teacher said, and this nice mister now have done you this workshop and now he want a feedback. I never say that. Yes. And, and <laughs> could you say what you think about it? And nobody was responding because every child was busy uh, shooting zombies with the game. <laughs> that was for me the yeah, best yeah. Uh, feedback ever. So <laughs> it was very nice. Did you, uh, two questions. One is, uh, did the game actually have artwork? And if yes, where did you get that? Or did you create it in the workshop? 
Yes, uh, I, I don't want to use the, uh, so Scratch has a little library of inbuilt artwork that you can use and you can import games or there's even a feature that you can uh, use a camera. And uh, there's a pixel paint and a vector paint program inside. And because my time was limited and the children were 15 years old, so I wanted to focus on programming and not on drawing, I, um, by design, uh, choose to make very simple graphics with a vector graphic program, because usually uh, as soon as you show the ch uh, children the, the inbuilt library of pictures, they are very busy choosing yeah. the uh, most colorful butterfly and then yeah. the uh, Windows-based Flash players crash even more because they, the computer overload with, with, uh, with moving large pixel areas yeah. around. So I just wanted simple graphics and, and they were still good looking. So. Okay. <coughs> Did you upload the game so we could um, wait? When I, we I think I no? think it should be uploaded. I, I'm not sure if I shared it, but I shared a, a similar one uh, in summer. So, but uh, you just look in Scratch and uh, Horst Jens or Zombie Games. And, uh, but it's basically and you find yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a bit hard actually to find something in Scratch, but I will I will put some tutorial on my homepage. Okay. It's it's <coughs> made with just three sprites, uh, so it's very cool. Three sprites and cloning, of course. Um, if anybody running, runs into that problem where they're teaching Scratch at a school where they don't want violent video games, <laughs> there's a very easy solution. We use it at MIT. Call it paintball. So uh, that it, it, you're uh, shooting paint mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. other things. And then zombies really hate red paint. So if you, <laughs> if you use red paint, it's just like killing a zombie. <laughs> But, and it looks good against the green, too. <laughs> I must also say I was very impressed with the students because from without uh, prompting, uh, one student asked, could I change the graphics with pictures of uh, kids in the school and teachers? <laughs> This was their unspoken. And I said, yeah. yes, you can, yeah. but don't put my name on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, so the conclusio is, um, well, if you, <laughs> you can hire me <laughs> or you can, if you want, go yourself in a, in a school and make a scratch uh, workshop. If they have good uh, computers, it's very fun to do. But if there's a chance, uh, use Linux, don't use Windows mm -hmm. to make it easy because it will hurt you back. So the Windows will, th that you allow them to use Windows will hurt you while teaching. So it will cost you valuable time where some whining, whining kid will have to reboot or, and. Or, or maybe go it. for a scratch one or is that, Not recommended. Uh, Scratch One has not a clone-to-clone -clone, uh, collision detection and, and some other things like Derek Sater. So okay. you can do things with Scratch One, but if you are used to Scratch Two, it's, it's very better. So you have more options, for, especially and, for games. And Scratch One isn't online, so it would have to be downloaded and yeah. installed, yeah. which is hard to do at schools. Like, yeah, yeah. As a guest, I mean. I wonder if it would, would be possible to get the whole Smalltalk engine of Scratch One to run. On the Emscripten in the browser, maybe? Maybe not that efficient, but they, like as a first. Well, that Snap is sort of like that. So, snap? That, yeah, yeah. The, um, some of the original developers of Scratch created a version for college um, at Berkeley, um, University of California at Berkeley, and it's gotten pretty robust. You can do quite a bit with it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm finished so, so far with. Mm -hmm. So, do, do you know any future plans where, where the development of Scratch is heading? Yeah, um, we, Horst and I met at a conference in Amsterdam in August, the Scratch conference, and we saw a demo of, it's called GP, so it's in a pre-alpha release right now, but GP for general purpose, and it's a block-based programming environment, and they've gone back to Smalltalk, so the entire thing is created in Smalltalk, but very powerful. And it allows kind of every level of programming, so being able to do full-blown app development for desktop and uh, portable. So it's it's got a lot of potential. And what we have seen, the very cool thing is you can program that like a child with uh, puzzling blocks together, logic blocks, or you have a slider, and then you have text-based uh, programming interface like you uh, usually yeah. did as a professional, and with a slider you can just and return. And does it, does it work in both ways? Can I write a text yeah, yeah. program yeah. and then yeah, yeah. Yeah, you turn that into it? Yeah. And I think this is for does, teaching a does huge, this always huge work? thing. We don't Probably, know. or most of the time it yeah, should. Yeah, they're pretty smart guys. One yeah. of the developers is in Germany, and one is in Japan, I think. Um, so it's sort of an international team. 
and they're still a few years away from it being ready for a wide release, but um, it's pretty robust for an alpha. So that's probably going to be the scratch of the future yep. or at yeah. from today's perspective. And they, they think it'll be the scratch and the Python of the future. It'll be that fusion, which is pretty exciting. And they definitely said Python was one of their um, forebuilder, something they, they liked. Free yeah. pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> German uh, work a lot. Uh, some of their ideals, the uh, idols, is, mm -hmm. and uh, they say they uh, want to make a general purpose uh, programming language that has the advantage of Scratch, so easy to teach, easy to use, but uh, is not limited like Scratch, because with Scratch you basically can, can just make games or animations, uh, or something that run in the browser, and they want that you can open files, that you can read files, that you can access the internet, that you can do your day-to-day -day stuff that you want do with yeah. computer codes. And, uh, but I, really I, I guess it's it. hard to like cater to all the audiences because there's Scratch is very good at being simple and easy to teach, but on the other hand, other languages like Python are easy to like do other things. I mean, yeah. it's still easy to teach, but not as easy as Scratch. On the other hand, Scratch is not as easy to open files with and like yeah. do pro yeah. general processing. So, so it will be a plan. Yeah. So uh, w when you said that uh, the the small talk. Based Scratch One had problems with rendering vector graphics. Is that fixed in GP? Um, I they I don't think they may not have plans for a vector uh, editing environment. That hasn't been a priority. So in Snap, the Snap software doesn't have vector. It supports vector graphics, so you can import um, SVG SWF. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, SVG. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, uh, the Snap edi uh, graphic editor is pixel based? Yes. Ah, yeah, okay. the, you can only edit pixel mm -hmm. graphics um, bitmap. But I guess if it's going to be a general purpose language, then there will be some connectivities and bindings yeah. to other languages so you can use. Yeah. yeah. And I suspect, yeah, it, I would say there's a good chance because I suspect there are some libraries for doing vector graphics. So. Yeah. Derek, you remember, will the cheap, so the uh, Scratch 2 successor, the cheap loose, uh, will it be open source? I don't know. I, don't know. But I know that the developers are, are definitely pro open source, mm -hmm. so I think there's a really good chance. And I think they're doing it independent of any institution, mm -hmm. which bodes well for open source. Okay, okay. But there, in all likelihood, there will be a Scratch 3.0 before GP. I really think within the next two years, there'll be a, new, a full scratch release and and that's likely to be html5 based so that it can run on tablets and, and not have any of the compatibility issues and run on windows then stay on. no comment uh, mm. uh, at least it, it reduces the like the problem of not being able to run on the raspberry pi stuff like yeah. that yeah. on yeah. the other hand for a raspberry pi you might want to have some native stuff anyway or like Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if anybody picks up. I think Scratch 1.4, is it's either open source or being open sourced, which means it would be easy for someone to develop a sort of 1.7 release or something, like adding cloning. That That's the killer feature, I think, that's missing for game development. I guess at that point, it will just be a marketing issue, like telling people, go for 1.7 because it's better than 2.0 or it has some advantages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe we need a new name. Yeah. Yeah. Scratch pie or something like that. <laughs> Raspberry scratch. Well, uh, itchy and scratchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah. Scratch and sniff. There's actually someone's created sniff as an enhancement for Scratch, which is pretty funny. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to, to move uh, Derek to the end of the podcast because I fear that the others uh, will not have time <laughs> to, to speak. Uh, but uh, it, it now makes sense if he, he speak about his Scratch workshop. Yeah, what of do course, you think? sure. Go yeah. for it. Sure. Okay, Derek, can you explain uh, what you did in Vienna, what you did before you was in Vienna, and what you did at Sunday? Yeah, so um, I just spent last week in South Africa teaching Scratch workshops for students and for teachers as part of the first annual Africa Code Week. So a continent-wide initiative to try to introduce coding to kids 
And I, I can't remember the, I think it's 17 countries this year. It was 17 to 20 countries in Africa. And this is called Code Week Africa? Or? Africa Code Week. Africa Code Week. Yeah, so for the past three years, Europe Code Week has been a, a special initiative in October to get um, code introduced into schools. Uh, and so they, the, they decided, hey, if it works in Europe, we should try it in Africa. And they got a bunch of volunteers for all, from all over the world, many of them employees of SAP, the big multinational software company. So they, um, they became a sponsor. What's interesting is, they, rather than just giving money, they actually recruited volunteers from all over their, I can't remember how many countries they're in, but it meant that there were all of these English and French and German people speaking all different languages coming to Africa that could work in communities where those languages were helpful. And so I'd never quite heard of anything like that continent-wide before. And they even built some buses to go to more remote areas with sort of these remote computer labs. Uh, but I spent all of my time in Cape Town, which meant it was quite easy since English is the national language there. Um, but I was able to do a lot of work with students around enabling them to explore Scratch on their own. So rather than being the, the token American white guy that comes in and says, ah, you should do this, it's really important, you'll make money, get out of poverty. It was really more about going and empowering them to express themselves with the technology. So really just sort of inviting them into the world of Scratch and giving them this, the space to mess around with it a little bit. And then with the teachers, it was about encouraging them to just be open to students trying out Scratch, using it for projects. So bringing it into the schools and, and really reassuring the teachers that in the US, very few teachers are experts in any of these technologies, but having just enough comfort to be able to allow space for them to be used by kids. So this idea of you don't have to be an expert to teach something in the 21st century, you just have to kind of be aware of it. And then after Africa, I came back here for Europe Code Week. So that just began on Saturday. And Sunday, Horst and I were part of a big workshop, big, 30 people. Um, it felt big, where we combined. It was in Vienna. Yeah, here in Vienna. The art, so, uh, art University. Yeah, combining um, Scratch and robotics and also this new technology a friend of ours has developed called turtle stitch that enables kids to design with blocks in the way that they do in scratch make complicated graphics but then transfer those graphics to an embroidery machine and sew their own t-shirts or bags or sew patterns on fabric so it was it was it was pretty cool and to see the balance between we were really showing all these different ways to use block-based programming and, and technology and demystifying coding. You can see the pictures of it on the internationalopenmagazine.org. We will upload it here together with the podcast. Yeah. Uh, there's really one picture, I made it, I'm very proud of it, uh, where you see uh, Andrea Meyer, the uh, head of uh, Turtle Stitch Project, explaining on a laptop some patterns, I think it was, uh, that there's a logo graphics mm -hmm. that were stitched with the stitching machines on textile. And a lot of girls and women uh, crowding behind them, and everyone has a smile <laughs> on their yeah. face because they were, I think, in their head, this was something like if we guys see a new computer game or something. <laughs> so it was there, they were figuring, ah, that could be on my clothing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really a, a good technique to, um, yeah, to, to get uh, people who are not uh, primary coders uh, into coding and show the beauty of code. Well, and even girlfriends and partners of hardcore coders are finally lured into the yeah. coding yeah. world. It's monochrome or it's in color? More uh, than one color? Well, that's the fun thing. Uh, this is a logo-like graphic, so, um, and you, the computer actually at Turtle Stitch allow only one color. But uh, if you take the time, you can make two, uh, two graphics and between printing them too, you can change the color of the uh, stitching oh, machine. Yeah. So you can, or, or you can make a, um, a thread as a string, with uh, who is built itself out of two uh, two different colored strings. So 
Yeah. It's like a bit like 3D printing, just just in two dimensions. Mm-hmm. So if you if you tinker with the machine and the material that you're printing with, you can uh, add color effects. But it's easier than 3D printing because you can't um, uh, print a ball with a, um, a green core. Well, it's two dimensional, so you can't yes, print a ball can, at all. It's impossible to print in your ball. Uh, the green core and it's uh, impossible to print the green core and uh, around of this um, the um, other material because you can't uh, position it in uh, in the uh, in the air I, th- I think it only does planner you, you have a planner yeah the, the, the stitching <laughs> machine from turtle stitch only can make two dimensions yes yes, yes. you're that's speaking that's now about 3d, uh, 3D yes. printing yes this yeah, is yeah. a uh, um, uh, better in yeah. Uh, uh, stitching yeah you can so to speak mm-hmm. yeah and it, far less um, problematic yeah. because you're not melting material mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> but it also has I think more instant gratification like I did a t-shirt and everywhere I go people are sort of dazzled and and it was it was one piece of thread but with seven different shades between green and yellow so it actually looks like several different threads Please, everyone should be trained. So, if you didn't hear, for the listener, we are uh, now seeing some really good uh, food. <laughs> food based. Uh, which which country is that? This is Kurdish food, and this is a warm uh, pre-dinner meal, so a warm starter. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. with. Um, Lentil and warm melon sunny. <laughs> so, so, so for the for for the most authentic podcast ex- experience, you are going to pause the podcast now, make yourself something to eat, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then you resume the listening okay, yeah. when we return yeah. as well. You also have to drink half a beer because every one of us has now exactly drunk, drunk uh, one quarter liter of beer. Yeah, so no, except uh, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry that we don't have scratch and sniff technology for Open Magazine yet. But not okay. yet. Not, not yet. yet. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to yeah, uh, ask you about your journeys, Derek. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I was at work and um, I think Horst sent me an email with a YouTube video, and um, it was wow. Ah, my food comes. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Prost euch. Karit, Karit. Bier, Bier. Okay. <laughs> no, I okay, but now by Derek. Um, I think it was in Brussels huh? and there was a bunch of people. Um, oh, yeah. I think at the, the first EU. <laughs> yeah. The first video was a bunch of people in front of the, uh, um, the European Parliament or so. Yeah. yeah. And um, there was a dance involved <laughs> in the Parliament. Yes. Also, what was this about? So um, I was at the EU almost by accident. I drove a friend there who's a Code Week ambassador for the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that I ended up being invited in. And before I knew it, I had become the first ambassador for the U.S. Because they'd been wanting to get somebody to come and hadn't been able to get an American to come all the way to Brussels. Mm -hmm. So uh, there I was in a T-shirt, a Code Week, EU Code Week T-shirt, And all of a sudden, they're teaching us how to dance. And I have no idea what's happening. But somebody came up with this idea for having a theme song, which is called Ode to Code. And then they would teach children this robotic dance all over Europe. And they would do this dance, but then they would remix it or modify it in a way, just like they would with a Scratch Project, to make it more the flavor of their country. Uh, So we did it initially to to show the playful side of all these ambassadors who are just volunteers Mm. uh, at the EU. And then because I thought it was a pretty fun idea, I did a version in Africa with the African children last week and was inspired by an Italian version that I'd seen where they started off doing it the correct way and then they're like, no, 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 we got (laughs) to do it like this. And they, um, and they kind of, spiced up the music and I thought ah we'll do it in Africa with beatboxing and Mm. children singing Mm. and it turned out pretty cool so if if people want they can do a search on YouTube for um, Africa Code Week Ode to Code or Ode to Code African Style yeah cool we will link link it in the show notes yeah yeah 
Hopefully. Yeah. Someone can be found at internationalopenmagazine.org. Yeah. And if you, um, if, you, if you really want to see something strange, because that's not strange enough, there's also a video of me break dancing in Africa <laughs> <laughs> during a coding workshop to, uh, to honor the, the sort of bravery of the kids that were willing to get up on stage and beatbox and sing. Mm. And so I thought I would do something that would be equally ris risky or not risque. That would be different. But um, so I, I tapped back into my 80s era refrigerator box dancing <laughs> gave it a try and got a standing ovation from some african kids yeah, it's so. called really, really crazy or what is that loud audio? yeah well what's great is if you're bald in 45 and from america <laughs> it's better if you do it badly that's what i learned do it badly and it's far more entertaining as if i had a choice <laughs> Yes, it's a recommendation. It was really fun to watch in my work just before I started <laughs> really to work. Uh, it, it was a good start into my working day. Yeah. So, so will these kids after the code week ended? Will they have the uh, will they have machines where they can actually continue developing? Or yeah, the work? schools that I went to had computer labs, and the that the headquarters for this was at a science museum in Cape Town, which has a, a dedicated computer lab. I was so moved and inspired that I'm going back for three months. So I agreed to go back in December and stay and work on follow through, not just for Cape Town, but for all of Africa, figuring out if we do it again next year, how do we make it something that isn't just for a week and isn't just about volunteers coming in, but really getting mentors and teachers trained to be able to continue beyond that week. Because I think if, if it's just one week, it's it's nice and exciting. But if it just happens once a year, then you might not get up to speed that fast. For, do, yeah. for those kids that are really interested. I guess not everybody has to be interested and not everybody will stick to that. But at least a small percentage. That, and then they should have the ability to access this, those machines and the language and the setup. Yeah, I totally agree. What's fun is to see some of... I know some of them are continuing because... They're uploading and sharing their projects on the Scratch website. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way that even for the volunteers that left, they, they can still have some contact with kids and teachers that they worked with, which really wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible almost at any other time until tools like Scratch that allow online collaboration came out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So now it's the dinner break. Uh, we will see you after the break. Yeah. Well, Master, uh, you make beatboxing tuning this time. <laughs> My understanding is it's it's the best selling computer of all time because that one model was on sale for years and years and years. Uh, how which, about you? Which first, which first, first game? My first game on was computer. Tetris on the Game Boy. Oh, yeah. classic. I, I'm a, a little bit younger than. You and um, so uh, 1990, uh, 1990, I get a Game Boy and my, with Tetris, my brother, um, a Game Boy with uh, Super Mario Land. Ah. And um, yes, and my first PC game should be, oh, um, uh, I don't know, I think... Solitaire, yes, it yeah. must be Solitaire, <laughs> yes. and um, yeah, Windows uh, three uh, eleven. Yeah. yeah, but I had an um, a console before the C sixty four. You had ah, yeah. you could plug it onto the TV. Yeah. Okay, and you you choose the game by switching. Ah, some, some switch. and there was the was no the famous game the Pong. Pong? Pong yeah. and I don't I, I don't remember I think there was three or four games on it. Yeah, but they were all variations of Pong, right? Yeah. Would, like you'd call it tennis because it would be yeah, that's right. And hockey, yeah. <laughs> there'd be two things. Of, you know, two. Yeah, I had that too. Yeah, ColecoVision in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. and sometimes it had a gun. You'd shoot a little dot on the television. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. How about you, Worst? Yeah, what's it? Uh, 
I not remember exactly, but I know that I was a gamer long before I had a computer. And I also know that I could uh, program basic before I had a computer because I was gifted, a, as I was 13 or 12, mm -hmm. uh, I was gifted a, a basic book. Oh. And I read it from, from yeah. I really cool. know it by heart and uh, I could write code. I, I remember I actually wrote code, basic code, uh, on with pen on paper. <laughs> just just to, yeah. because I was mm -hmm. so excited. Yeah, but I think one of my first games was a Saxon for the yeah, Commodore Saxon. 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 Yeah, 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 which was actually 3D, yeah. uh, kind of yeah, like fake 3D. 3D and and yeah. I loved it because I was uh, in the in the Lunar Park of Vienna, in the Prater, there mm -hmm. was a, a card machine where you put in coins to play that. And then I said, wow, I would save so much money because I can that now play at home. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then I remember we tried to copy the audio tapes with... This mm -hmm. uh, we tried to copy it on a on a stereo uh, <laughs> thing and it was not working. And then we with a pen we we had these audio tapes somehow uh, um, messing around so with the tapes and mm -hmm. cutting it and fixing it. Did you yeah. actually figure out why copying those uh, cassettes uh, didn't we, we work? Were, we were children, uh, so um, but you, you you didn't have any. Uh, I copied a lot of games later, but uh, not so much on tape because then I saved for a floppy disk. So, <laughs> so you never figured out. That's something that you should figure out for next podcast. How to copy old games yeah. with music cassettes on a stereo. Yeah, it should have worked, but it did not work. So. But we were young. So. <laughs> it could be possible that it's mono. <laughs> Yeah, That's but, so but uh, this is one uh, th this is one problem. So the first attempts I um, tried to um, get game music from the C64, um, it was just a half success because I had the uh, music only on my left ear. <laughs> so, yes. But that's game music, right? You actually tried to copy the data? We, would, we wanted to copy the Saxon game, yes? Yeah, we had it yeah. on one tape that was working and we wanted to mu multiply it. So we so had a lot of criminal well, yeah. energy with, with 12 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Never bought a game. Uh, <laughs> in for C sixty four, I think it was we all really copied it. Possible. I could it, there were not, was not even jobs. jobs yeah, so and, 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 and I remember there was uh, um, uh, there was uh, 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 a shop you where you could buy um, C sixty four games, but only very few, and this was called Niedermeyer. It was in, I yeah. <laughs> think it's gem. not uh, around anymore, but it's one, only two or three with for, for the listeners, we are all male, we are all in our 30s or 40s, and we all We're have... Oh, 20s. 20s. <laughs> <laughs> only, only Thomas, he's, he's 18 years old, and uh, <laughs> we all now have a, a look with, with, with glossy eyes, like, like we think about lost girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're in your 20s, could, can we say you came post-graphical interface, post-mouse? Like, Were you uh, born after 1984? Yes. Ah. So my first, com like my, my first computer exp uh, game experience was, I guess, the NES. There's, uh, like, there was this prepackaged game where you had Super Mario Bros. 1, mm. Tetris, and Nintendo World Cup, I think... 92 or, or it was based on the World Cup of 92 so I think Cameroon was the worst one and I'm not sure which so basically the, 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 the teams were ranked based on how they uh, fared in the actual World oh, yeah. Cup yeah. Uh, those games were pretty fun and then my like my computer experience started with a, a 486 that already had a mouse it already had a sound cluster 16 wow. and a CD drive a double speed CD drive which oh, wow. was a big thing back yeah, then. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how I got started. Well, to, to uh, move back from memory lane to, to present, uh, I can <laughs> present time. I can uh, report that I today buy the humble bundle with bitcoins because bitcoins is no real money. I can you spend that all on <laughs> on, on humble you bundles. It's actually one of the few things I use the bitcoins for. Mm. And yes, there was a humble bundle, and included was Sir, you are being hunted. Yes. And this is a tweet punk game uh, because you play in a British island, uh, post general generated, so randomly generated British island where you somehow by a time machine uh, you, or some, some kind of steampunk device, you are teleported there with very minimal uh, equipment and then you are hunted 
by uh, British upper class robots who make a sport of hunting humans. And this yeah, is very this cool. Is <laughs> and this is an um, cool ego shooter, uh, sneak around uh, game like Thief. So. Oh, thank you. Nicht die Nerven Ja, okay. Herrlich. Dankeschön. Bitte. Dankeschön. Ich bitte da. And well, it's the super fast. The game. Ja. Ja, genau. Es werden die leeren Teller ähm, abserviert. Die sind alle leer und es hat allen geschmeckt, so was ich mitbekommen habe. Hm? Well, to, to Sir, you are being hunted. Um, mm -hmm. The game um, is around the, centered around the theme that you start with, uh, with luck. So you lack equipment, you lack um, safety. You, you lack everything, so it, you get a very paranoid feeling. Mm. You must play it with, with headphones because you have to listen very carefully and you have to sneak around. You always hide like a like a little insect in the darkness, in dark Just corners and woods. And, and then you fear the robots and, and you have, uh, even if you start with a gun, you have very limited uh, ammunition. Mm. And then you have to loot uh, buildings and the buildings are far less than the game of Thomas because there's just blocks but you cannot walk into the blocks you just can touch with a hand you can touch the uh, door of the building and then mm. you get a loot inventory screen where you can loot more or less useful items and as far as I understood it while you're looting and inspecting in the inventory screen the items the game goes on so you can be actually be shot I, I was not sure if, if Maybe it's is it, is it a like multiplayer game or do you just play it locally There's against a, bots? Yeah, I played a uh, um, single player, but there was a multiplayer option in the menu, but I did not figure out how... So in the, in the single player game you can actually get, I don't know, hit or shot by computer bots while you're yeah. looting a building? Yes, well, I did not ac experience that. Uh, uh, I was not being shot while looting, but um, I noticed that the shadows uh, moved because there's the sun at night, uh, uh, night and day cycle, and I had the impression that the game does not pause while I'm inspecting the inventory. But for me, it's not not fun. I mm -hmm. want to have my time to inspect ah. each thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and, but but the other thing what, um, was I want to go inside a house. And, and then see the inside of the house. I don't want to stay outside the house and have a three three meter long arm and and, and uh, loot inside the, the building. It makes no sense. Yes. So yeah, well, uh, but you can sneak. You can uh, actually crouch. Then you feel like an insect. So you have a very low point of uh, view, and you have a visib visibility um, um, radar. Radar like uh, interface. Yeah, like yeah. a meter. That's yeah, yeah. You, you, mm, it's you're hidden or not? Hidden, yeah, yeah. And you, know? you see how much hidden you are. So yeah. if if you're really hidden, you you uh, the the robots can go, go very close to you, and uh, you hear them very very cool. They make so um, electronic noises. They say hello. Is there someone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go on down. This might be dangerous. <laughs> so they are like like a mixture of, of British upper class hunting society and. <laughs> Are today too from ah. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cool. Yeah, and yeah, and, and you must gather artifacts to build uh, your teleporter to go back to the to your real human world. And you can, um, as far as I understood, you can choose um, to to battle it out with the robots okay. and then hunt for uh, loot, loot them for more weapons and so. Or you can just uh, sneak around or just try to. The, the robots are noise sensitive, so you can try to to make a distraction for them, so they, they heat toward the noise, and then you can try to, to clean uh, passages where you are, where the robots normally patrol, so you can mm -hmm. try to, to manipulate them. Um, but it, it's a very um, claustrophobic, paranoid so thing. Survivor, so. stealth. Yeah, yeah. That, that. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice scenario. Mm -hmm. And this was the only game in the Humble Bundle? No, there were a lot of games, but this was the only one I actually yeah, tested. Yeah. Today. I also thought about it because I, I like the title <laughs> so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, even look at what it um, nice, sounds like nice in, in French. Yeah. This is um, Vous êtes chassé, monsieur. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Baguette. Schöne <laughs> Palpa <laughs> Frosse. Mm. Um. 
Gregor, you had a very fascinating, fascinating topic you wanted to go in at cinema. Ah, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, there's a movie in the cinemas um, called The Martian with Matt Damon in um, the main um, role uh, part and Jeff Daniels, I think, uh, yeah. is also with it. And I was, or uh, well, I am in very interested in this film because um, mm -hmm. there was a book. Um, um, that is very successful and um, I heard in many podcasts about it and they uh, were all um, very enthusiastic about it and um, this morning I heard an interview with Matt Damon and he said um, this film is uh, like a love letter to science and engineering and so I'm into it. I have yeah. to, to watch it and the um, story plain and simple um, Matt Damon plays an astronaut um, who is forgotten on Mars on a mission and um, then he has to survive on Mars for uh, a period of time until the rescue mission. So comes it's to like, uh, like Kevin allein zu Hause. It's uh, yeah, so a mixture of <laughs> Kevin allein zu Hause or Robinson Crusoe on Mars, which is also an older film. Didn't he also play in the movie that came out like one or two years ago? Yeah, this he played in this uh, Interstellar. <coughs> Interstellar, yeah. Interstellar. But it does not have any relation to that. Well, nearly yeah. the same. There, he's also lost on a planet. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like, yeah, yeah, from, from the, the uh, this is, no, no, from yes. the characters or from the story, it's a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's more like Castaway, the oh, the yeah. Tom Hanks mm -hmm. film, like being stuck on a desert island kind of thing, except with no food. And no and oxygen. No packages and no Wilson. Yeah, exactly. No volleyball on yeah. Mars. <laughs> <laughs> you saw the first part of the film? <laughs> well, I saw the first part, but I couldn't understand hardly any of it because I don't speak German. <laughs> which, which, by the way, is why this podcast episode is in English for the one American at the table who's totally ignorant. But I thought, well, I've been spending time in Munich and, and Vienna. Maybe I, it would be great to go and see a movie in... in um, German and I thought well if it's an action movie mm -hmm. then no big deal like I'll, I'll be able to follow and and the first first act maybe the first 15 20 minutes I could follow pretty well but at a certain point it just becomes like Matt Damon doing his video diary for the day and, <laughs> and then Jeff Daniels at a press conference and, and so yeah I just at a certain point it just became silly like mm -hmm. I took off the 3d glasses and and went out and thought hey, it was worth paying the money for the experience. And, yeah. But it, the film does, it's so beautifully shot, it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. And so I really do want to see it in English. And, yeah. and I miss Matt Damon's voice. I, I kind of thought maybe he would dub it in German because he speaks German in the Bourne movies. And I thought, oh, well, he could do it, right? He's Matt Damon. But it's clearly not Matt Damon. Okay. I guess once, once the actors get like the, they're assigned dubbing actor yeah. then they stay the same mm -hmm. Except oh, yeah. for, I, guess, I was wondering about that yeah I, I think it, it's like when they're not uh, <laughs> famous yet so for some actors if they if you watch the really early mo movies of them they might get some random uh, dubber assigned or voice actor assigned but once they so for example Bruce Willis always have to has the same voice actor so you get kind of used to the voice of Bruce of the German voice of Bruce Willis <laughs> <laughs> Uh, except the um, uh, Stipp Langsam 3, Die Hard, Die Hard 3, um, uh, the uh, voice actor was um, ill. Oh, ah, okay, ah. so it switched. Yeah, sometimes, That's sometimes the film switch. didn't work. I think it, it, it happens for. Uh, I think it happened for the voice actor of Marge Simpson that she died, and it happens yes. for some others as well. So the the voice actor or the the dubber dies before the real actor, so they have to ch exchange it for some oh, other wow. actor. Mm -hmm. So that also happens. Also, it's interesting for um, for some movies and TV series, the dubbing actually doesn't really follow the real script, and sometimes that makes things better. So there's, yeah. for example, some UK or US uh, TV series mm -hmm. that uh, weren't that successful in the original country with the original voice, but due to the kind of not really mm. close to original voice acting and just putting in some uh, additional this yes, so uh, you can jokes. find it on wikipedia yeah. there was a certain um, team in germany that um, made the dubbing for the Bud Spencer movies, yeah. for example, 
But a good example is also um, there was a TV series with Donny Curtis and Roger Moore. Yeah, the two. It's in, in German, it's the two. Are many it's more jokes uh, the, than in the original. The, the Persuaders. Ah. It's called the Persuaders. Ah, yeah. Persuaders is ah, the yeah. original title. Okay. And in German, it's D2. Mm -hmm. And like, if, if you watch the. So I have the DVD box, and if you watch the English one, it's just. It's kind of fun. and But in German, it's just really overdone. And, and to the way that sometimes the lips don't move. Because in the original, they didn't say anything, but in German, it just overdubbed <laughs> two or three jokes into the whole story. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> and Kefi voller Helden, uh, that's oh, a, yeah. an okay. example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are jokes um, in, uh, without any um, forbidden, uh, connection to a uh, relation to the English uh, um, uh, version. Mm -hmm. So it's. Uh, Totally the diff uh, totally different um, uh, text uh, they speak. Mm -hmm. Has anyone seen the unauthorized Phantom Menace fan edit where they dub Jar Jar Binks into this nonsensical alien language just so they can use subtitles to add some meaning to that character? <laughs> It's hilarious, and he doesn't sound Jamaican in the in the Phantom Menace one. Well, one thing I thought in um, in The Martian, I actually thought that Jeff Daniels' voice was so good that maybe he should dub Jeff Daniels in English. Because <laughs> Jeff Daniels can be a little annoying in certain roles. Like The thing that you, that you mentioned that they had to change Jar Jar Binks' voice to actually subtitle him. Uh, you yeah. know of, all, of the meme with the Downfall movie? No. Yeah. Well, like uh, Hitler finds out something. Uh-huh. So there's there's this movie Downfall where oh right yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with it yeah. yeah and like they subtitle different things into that uh -huh. it's actually if you if you if you're native German speaking it's really hard you have to turn off the voice because mm -hmm. yeah. you listen to it, the actual text uh -huh. and you don't really like you can't concentrate on the subtitles. Uh, it was Whereas, a really popular uh, meme. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's still remember. Remember. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There are some uh, uh, fan-made um, dubs like uh, Lord of the Weed and Star Trek Enterprise um, uh, Perkening. Okay. Perkening is a whole film. Uh, oh, okay, that's another fi uh, movie. I don't remember mm -hmm. the name of and the There dub. are Viennese dubbings of, I think, Alf. Ah, okay. And uh, MacGyver, ah. <laughs> which like really... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which brings me back to the Martian. Um, I think for me it makes it interesting the MacGyver thingy uh, in it, yeah, yeah. so that he has to deal with a short amount of water and have to invent to be inventive and so so on. So and and it's made by Ridley Scott, so yeah, yeah. I'd have to say more. Yeah, <laughs> and it's also a bit like Apollo 13, ah, where yeah. they're having to come up with all these innovations, like yeah. So, ah, I remember um, um, MacGyver will be um, uh, 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 well, verfilmed um, as uh, now uh, not it uh, should be uh, there are uh, no, a new uh, no uh, a really? new series a new a series a new series MacGyver yeah. no do it yes okay. with McDamon <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay>. on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> No. Mac Damon. <laughs> Mac Damon. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Gaiva. <laughs> I, it's not related, but I want to, to tell a little. Well, it's not very funny. Yes, a fun, fun, pseudo funny story. I was um, witness at the election in Vienna. So you can uh, actually go to a party and say you, uh, you want to witness the election, and then yeah, you sit on this long table, uh -huh. and the mm -hmm. people come and, and you look very official. They all think you now at the city government and salute you, and so it's uh -huh. very cool for the so to improve the social status. And well, and one, and you, you think, okay, it's, it's it's paper. We have no voting machines here in Vienna. This is all traditional done like 100 years before. And uh, you you put uh, so you you go in the cabin mm -hmm. in the where you're not yeah. seen yes, mm -hmm. and then you put your vote uh, actually two uh, two um, papers to fill out, 
um, district vote and, and city vote, yes. and then um, you put the papers in the box. It's, mm -hmm. it's not so complicated. Yes. <laughs> and uh, because you, I live normally in a bubble with, with, with people where I think they all can read and write, and so I was not aware that how, how many different people exist. There were actual people <laughs> who, who did not understand the voting process. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, Vienna, has, uh, some some were first-time voters, uh, can also be immigrants who are first time to allow to vote. But one was actually going out of the cabin, mm -hmm. yes, and said, "Do I have to also fill the name? You can uh, write a name of a preferred candidate." And then they said, "No, no, just make the cross." And, so, mm -hmm. and then there was one woman, an educated woman, white, so middle age, and uh, she got in, yes. And there were a lot of people, and she really managed to spo uh, to uh, to spoil two um, box of votings, also these these boxes, these containers where the voters mm -hmm. are done, because she got um, to the one table where so the tables are organized where in, in which zone of Vienna you live. Yes, mm -hmm. so she showed her identity card, she got her voting papers, she got in the cabin, filled her vote, but then there was too much people uh, going up at the table where she was come from. So she simply got to the another table, but this another table is for people from another district, so oh, to yeah. speak, yes, from another group of houses, yes. And she put her vote inside this other box, yeah, yes. Course. And then they, we were all a bit too slow to react. And then we said, hey, lady, you, you, uh, you come from this table and put your vote in, in our box. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, I think uh, this is so, so organized. I go one, uh, I go in at one side and go out at the other side. So she oh, was from so some middle management. <laughs> yeah. And this was not the case. But in fact, she ruined uh, both boxes with votes. Because now the one box had one vote to less. And oh. another box had one vote too much. And in the end, it does not change the, who is governing the city. Yes, but yeah. still, it's it's uh, the, the stats, the, the per district. Yes, stats could you be you you st yeah. uh, you. She really managed to damage uh, the democratic but, but process in 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 not as a, in. She made the maximum damage with the minimum effort. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because and you, and you can do nothing about it, huh? Yeah, but what can you do? Uh, all the you, people. Also, so you shouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Identify. Yeah. Right. Yes. Whatever you yeah, do yeah. will be. It's will good, be very but worse. you can't do yeah. anything yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. So, so what really happened was that we we all were very shocked. Yes, and and then the um, the city um, city government paid. Um, Heat, heat uh, administrator of this table uh, wrote wrote down the incidents. He said, uh, so he he must write a protocol, mm -hmm. and he wrote down yes one vote cast files. And I, I was not there at the counting of the votes. But what can you do? You cannot ask the lady in public, uh, what do you vote? I mean, that makes the But I, but I guess I mean how many votes are in one of these boxes then? Uh, there are around uh, 1,000 votes in one Yeah, vote. so it, it doesn't count that much if one vote gets... Yeah, of, of I mean, course not, not, but... And I guess these I incidents can. happen like yeah, yeah, once of course. per... Yeah, but that's but, but I, I, mm. yeah. yeah, but I was thinking <laughs> yeah. voting is so simple, it, yeah. you cannot ruin that, but no. you can actually, yeah. without uh, without purpose. But it, it just mess, it's just messing up the per district stats, it doesn't really mess up the whole particle. Um, well, in this some? in this case, not because uh, not because both um, tables were on the same uh, district, so they had the different set of yeah. uh, they had the same set of candidates. Mm -hmm. So, but what really happened? So um, the one uh, you could not vo uh, ask her what you voted because that could be manipulated, and you you could not open the box and try to Great grab shit. the uppermost. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this. <laughs> the thing is, there is there is uh, you just vote for the party, right? Which is the same for all of Vienna, but then you can also give vote for the pre candidates. preferred yeah. candidates in so two lists. Do you actually get a different voting sheet for different districts um, with different candidate names, or do you put the candidates' names in? Yes, this can happen. Uh, you you have uh, different um, sheets for different districts, but uh, both tables were luckily in the same district. It was just so it different zones. It didn't matter at all. It didn't not, even mess up the district stats. It did case. not. Uh, well, it depends how, how the voting was then um, at the end, uh, how, how the, counts, how, how the okay. counting was done. Yes, But the correct thing, uh, because for official uh, result of the vote, yeah. you must say this block of houses, this sub-district, okay. had exactly this result. And she messed up. So the boxes are not just divided by district, but also by 
part. Yeah, spr- of the it's called Sprengel. It's, it's like five houses, mm-hmm. a, a thousand people around. Yes. And then she, ma- she ma- managed to, to mess up bo- two Sprengel uh, results. Yes. Mm-hmm. And another lady, um, so this was the, the worst case, and she, it was not intentional. But we, we, we have found no solution how, how to resolve that. Yeah, it's and, and it's then, uh, good it's good that you didn't find a solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but <laughs> what you want to do. And and another um, thing was uh, one lady uh, was um, correctly also um, getting her identity card, putting her vote, mm-hmm. and then she was putting her voting papers inside the box. Yes. Okay. And yeah, we we all were satisfied. And then she uh, hold up the envelope. Where usually you put the papers in an envelope so ah. that nobody can see it and put the envelope in the box. And she said, "What do I have to do with the envelope?" And we ah. all were face palming. Ah. So. <laughs> oh. And then yeah. she and then she choked. Ha, 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 now you now you know what I voted for. <laughs> <laughs> so was it work? <laughs> yeah, but but there the problem was less uh, dramatic mm-hmm. because if you count the votes, uh, you make a big heap of all the envelopes, and then you open all the envelopes and make so a big heap of the papers. No yes, if she was the if she was not the only one who, who did mm-hmm. it, thing, mm-hmm. but you could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it's possible to say she uh, voted for. Green, because yeah. every of these, um, and not, not for F, uh, FPÖ, for the right wing because uh, every FPÖ um, voter had um, forgotten to put it in the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> no, also, uh, I, I have, have no but, insight in it. There's in no certain protocol for this kind of accident. No, but no. Uh, what I want to say is it is important that uh, you register as witness for voting. It, it costs you ma- nothing. You just have to go to a one uh, political party and say you want to um, go witness, and they have to give you a paper that you official witness. Mm-hmm. Because if only um, um, if only people from a certain political direction are heading this uh, voting oh, committee, yeah. they can then uh, uh, resolve such incidents like they wish. Mm. And especially if you so from a small party, you from or have from yeah from ever, from as much people as possible. And, and voting is a democratic process. You you get democratic people from all kind of intelligence, from all kind of. Background. But isn't it like that in the committee? There's always at least one from every party. No, that is not the case. Not the case in Vienna. That is ideally the case, but yeah. uh, but especially the smaller parties have not the manpower to uh, to have witnesses for each um, voting district uh, office. So it's, it's uh, especially if you if you sympathize with a smaller party, it's important that you uh, say yourself you want to be with witness. Yeah, just just I, I was not aware that so much can go wrong by voting, <laughs> but it it can. So you uh, the uh, the other people know you are uh, a voter of this party because uh, you want to uh, um, uh, witness. Actually, not because. Um, Only the people at the table, also the other witnesses, yeah. uh, know because of course we say I'm here from this and this party. Yeah. But even uh, the only people who really knows it is the head of the of the voting table. Mm-hmm. So because he has to control that uh, you have an official document that the party sent ah, you, okay. and he's not uh, forced to disclose your the origin of your yeah. party to the others. And even that does not mean that you vote this party. So and, and you, yeah, you could still go to a different party yeah. and uh, ask for a seat there. Even yeah, you could, you could make else. mischief and go to the, the party you dislike most, yeah. register as a witness for them, and then make a uh, witness in, in your... As Is a it actually the public who was witness for which party? Um, may, there, there should exist lists for that. Yes, I, I'm not sure if the... Uh, so we can look uh, you up somewhere in the voting results. May, maybe, yes. yes. So it's, uh, it's possible to... Um, um, uh, um, uh, t- to, uh, uh, to view the uh, votes counting? Yes, uh, I, I made that several times. It's not uh, not difficult. Uh, Actually, helped with that. Ah, okay. Uh, um, uh, also, if you are not part of a, a party. Yeah, I'm not part of any ah, party. Okay. Yes, I just uh, the the only thing is, if you want to be official witness, yeah. yes, sit yeah. on this table and and help at the counting. Yes, you must be um, accepted by at least one mm. party. So you go to one party party of your mm. preference or any party who seeks a member and you get an um, Wahleintrittsschein, a paper document that say we want this man 
with this mm -hmm. name or these people with this uh, name to be witness mm -hmm. for us at this party. Okay. So that's the, the only restriction, but it's, it's a, a thing of five minutes. It costs you one telephone mm -hmm. call and they send you the papers. Yeah. Uh, you weren't a, a, a witness of a party, you was a witness... Uh, um, uh, I was witness for the Green Party. Ah, okay. Yeah, I was um, but uh, uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, um, it's possible to um, to be um, a witness? witness without a party. Well, one of the party has to uh, um, has to accept you. Has to, okay. has to give you the document that you are an official witness. Ah, okay. That must not be the party you are a member of or mm. that you vote for. Uh, uh, <coughs> because I would. Um, uh, um, You want witness? No, no uh, I want to. Um, ah, ich spreche mal auf Deutsch. Er ist gerade weg. <laughs> uh, um, ich For our English listeners, please fast forward five minutes and you'll <laughs> no. get back to the English content. <laughs> uh, ich würde einfach nur mal gern zuschauen. Yeah, ohne yeah. dass ich uh, ein, uh, dass ich sonst Schein brauche. So then he said he want to just observe a voting ah, with, observe, without, yes. uh, without having mm. a special document. Okay. Well, you could ask to do that, but the official uh, reaction, at least in Vienna, would be that they, they refuse that. Uh -huh. That they say no um, to sit here on this table, also on the mm -hmm. you witnessing. Have you have to uh, need a document from okay. a registered political party that they mm -hmm. officially sent you. Uh, I think this is a bit of security mechanism that mm -hmm. not any uh, kind of hooligan can go in and, and intimidate the, the contest. Ah, okay, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Because, well, <laughs> uh, you mean I'm a hooligan? No, that not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 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 okay. Yeah. To, to do you actually have to be Austrian or do you have to be Viennese to do that? No, I think the witness you only on you only need uh, to have an identity card and you have this card that one of the parties uh, wanted to you you to be the witness for for them. And is it hard to get a spot there, or is it just? No, it's, it's extremely simply because all the uh, I mean, the, are the they have are they too few manpower? Okay, so that's always looking for people. They're always to help. looking for, and especially if you. And one of the benefits, just to be, say an example, mm -hmm. the last elections I was coming very late to the uh, election, mm -hmm. uh, and then helped at the counting. But this time I had only time in. Also, um, I had the workshop with uh, with Derek, so I was only there for some hours before noon, and I just sit there and helped. Yes, helped. Uh, Well, I basically, just, just sit there and smile to the people and, and like, explain to <laughs> them, uh, come here, yes, and wait a bit, and we have much to do. And uh, the fun thing is, where I profit enormous, uh, I met one guy who was a former work uh, colleague with, yeah. of mine, and I've seen him at Game City one weekend before, mm -hmm. but we, and then I said, what? You you actually we are neighbors now. You you vote, uh, you you <laughs> reside in in ah, my yeah. uh, area, two two houses away. And he said yes, uh, since two years. <laughs> and and <laughs> no, none of us, even if ah, we sa yeah. have seen us several yeah. times, none of us had the idea to check uh, that uh, some of us uh, had changed the location mm. and we are now neighbors. And uh, uh, this alone is very uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. And and to meet uh, neighbors and other people who, who you don't see very often, mm. that's fun. And that everyone was thinking that I'm now some somehow connected to the city government because I was sitting at the table. <laughs> everyone yeah, was very the way you put the most respect for like, yeah. 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 Official horse business. Uh, official horse <laughs> business. And, and everyone was coming to me first and not to the official clerk yeah. uh, because I was more friendly. Kiss my ring. Kiss my ring. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to vote. Ne next year I will say, you... No. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> well, especially if you recognize that woman, you'll be like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 you shouldn't no. vote. No, no, you should not vote. Yeah. You, you, you should. You won't vote. Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, just uh, just go uh, register yourself for voting business. It's not big fun. Well, the biggest fun was beside me was an old man, uh, actually uh, not a priest, but a. Um, um, How you say a volunteer, not monk, but a volunteer Catholic uh, pseudo priest? How you call them? A Lime Brother. Uh -huh. Who is in a Catholic so, organization? Like a deacon or something. A deacon, like yeah, 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 yeah. A so, rookie brother. Uh, <laughs> some, something. And uh, he gifted me uh, a little Maria statuette or so, and a, okay. and a suite. Okay. Ah. Yeah. And next to him was an old lady, and she brought a box, a plastic box with. It was mushroom-shaped chocolate 
chocolate cookies or something. Yeah? So okay. little little mushrooms, but uh, made out of <laughs> chocolate. And she could not get that open. It was a plastic container, and then she was an old lady, so she cried, and, and then she said, I could not get it open, I could not get it open. Mm. Well, and the other people were busy um, with their lists and checking the lists, mm -hmm. and Finally, uh, she, she tried it and it made rich and all these mushrooms were flying around. Wow. <laughs> and then we collected these mushrooms. So it, well, if, you, if you're easy to entertain, it's, it's enough, enough fun there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's all my voting, voting witness adventures. Yeah. We out of topics? Thomas? Any more scratch topics? There's the, the, the recording that's coming up, Robo Wunderkind. Robo Wunderkind, yes. Yeah. That's what you hear uh, now, if, if we have nothing more to say. Uh, Later. We, we inter ah. Thanks. We <laughs> interviewed uh, Miss Anna from Robo Wunderkind. Yeah. This is a startup who make a very cool uh, robot for five-year-old children. And the robot you can program by visual programming. Yeah, it's, it's a whole kit. So it comes with all different parts and sensors and, and even a, a five or six year old can put it together and program it in different ways. And what I like about it is that it's, it's progressive. So it starts with a very simple, colorful programming language app on a tablet and then they can gradually start using Scratch. And then eventually the plan is they can even do full blown Python coding for these robots and build basic machines. Exactly. And the robot is made out of little cubes that you can put together as you nice. see fit. <coughs> so en okay. enjoy the interview. Uh, it's linked and we'll, we'll also yeah, link to the Kickstarter local. page. It's, it's a Vienna-based company. And the Kickstarter is still open, right? It's still running? Yeah. Will it be running when the, this podcast is published? I think the it podcast will be published tomorrow. Of October. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if we manage to publish that, or if Horseman, or who does the publish? Okay. I know what I have to do today. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, I would have a small topic. To yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, we, before the podcast, we talked a bit about uh, like how important it is to get immediate feedback and how the like the time between programming something, actually seeing the result affects the way you work. Uh, how do you think about uh, what's the state of the art, especially in Scratch, about how, uh, how you can make that period between programming something and seeing the result as small as possible? And are there still ways to improve that even more from the state of the art? Instant gratification. Yeah, I think there's, there's tons of room to improve it, but what's so incredible is to see a child take a program, run it, whether it's a game or an animation, and be changing aspects of the program and automatically see it happening. Mm -hmm. So in a program like Scratch where you can't really, it's very hard to crash. There are no, uh, bugs aren't really, because it's blocks. Um, but it, it really makes it easy for children to understand by making a change and seeing instantaneous results. And you can even test out blocks before you've added them to a script which is a pretty powerful thing, being able to click a block or a section of a block. So when I was young, we couldn't run a section of a program, but in Scratch, you can divide your program into all these pieces and just click on part of it and it automatically runs, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I actually do stuff like reverse debugging or like do reverse? Not, or not do you think exactly. that would be helpful for the kids? Yeah, yeah, I think it would. And, and a lot of people are arguing that Scratch has removed some of what's useful in debugging. So people are looking at ways to introduce more debugging in future versions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so for the input right now, Scratch is mostly dragging stuff, maybe text input as well? Yeah, dragging and then you can, you can change, um, you can type in text or num numeric values inside blocks. Yeah, so do you think there's any would it be easier to somehow input these, not via the keyboard or via the mouse, but some different? Would that still be some advantage or would it just be... Yeah, well right now, uh, I, I know people at MIT that have created, they call it type blocking. So it means instead of dragging each block, when you're doing a lot of programming in Scratch or any block-based programming, the bottleneck is you have to go to each individual category to get to where the blocks are, which is a big disadvantage over typing code. So someone thought, well, what if we could type and the blocks would just appear? 
So like a text filter or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. And so you would type if, and an if block would pop up, and you could tab into mm -hmm. the next field and type greater than, and and so um, and then you can very quickly do it, and it gets back to this idea of GP, where in GP you can be typing or dragging whichever is more convenient for what you're doing, and maybe you start off at a really rudimentary dragging blocks together, and then gradually getting more and more confident until it's kind of pure code. But there are also big advantages to block-based programming when you are troubleshooting as a teacher. You can really see very quickly uh, how things work with color and shape and, and um, position. Yeah. And I guess for that, it's also important to input values, not just by text, but also by... I mean, that's something that I experience when I do some graphics programming. You just enter some value, like it's 0.2 or something, if it's something between 0 and 1. Yeah. And then you, you try it and you figure out, okay, it should be a bit more. And then you go with, especially if it's compiled language, you got to go with 0.3. But that's too much. So you yeah. kind of... Yeah. And if you should just have some way of just having a slider or something? Well, or it's funny you yeah. say that. I was about to say Scratch does. When you create a variable, by default it displays on the stage. If you double click that display, it goes to a slider. So you could just double click on a variable at any time that's being displayed and adjust it all in real time, get it just to the right value and then set that value in your block. Yeah. And then you double click it a third time and it goes back to being um, just a, a display box or you, there's a checkbox to hide and show variables. So it works pretty well. Yeah, I think that's very important, especially for yeah. graphics programming and stuff like that, where yeah. you you know that it ends up, or you don't know that it ends up at point two, three, seven, eight, four, or something like that. But visually, or just looking at that, you can kind of easily tweak it, just seeing the result and then getting that instant feedback. Yeah, Absolutely. and for animation, it's really helpful yeah. when you're working out timing, and also because kids can compose music with Scratch. They can try out different values for the, the tempo, and, and, and you could even use a variable to adjust all those tempos or all those notes and do it with one slider. It's pretty cool. What does it use for creating the music or for synthesizing the music? It ha it's using, um, Flash has a built-in MIDI set that's fairly limited, and that's one thing, Scratch 1.4, has somewhat more sophisticated music making capabilities than 2.0 because of the limitations of Flash. So, so Scratch 2 just uh, like puts the, all the MIDI commands to the system and the system does, does whatever MIDI renderer you have? No, it's not true MIDI. So you can't, uh, you can't use, if you have a sound card with its own MIDI sound library, yeah. you can't use that with Scratch. It's totally self-contained. Music is, is sort of a blind spot. It's not a high priority for most of the people at MIT, but there are a few really passionate people that have worked on Scratch. Mm. And typically, if you get to know them, you can try out their version of Scratch where they have tons of music synthesis. And now, as of August, if you go to Scratch X, so it's just um, scratchx.org, there's a parallel version of Scratch with all these third-party extensions that you can try out. So you can use different controllers like a leap motion controller to let you do 3D motion control. Um, and a friend of mine has developed a full-blown synthesizer plugin where you can really do like we did on the Commodore 64 with attack, decay, sustain, and release, and you can create your own sounds and stuff. It's pretty cool. Sounds good. Yeah. And it's... Um, Anybody can develop their own Scratch extensions just using JavaScript. For for the 2.0 version or yeah, for yeah. the 2.0 version. For the 1.0 version, is also or for 1.0. It didn't 1 .X. have an extension. It didn't have an open architecture for ex extensions. So you have to write in Smalltalk or somehow make Smalltalk interact with. The yeah, other. or what most people will do is because Snap is a parallel version that is open source. You can you can modify Snap any way that you want. So for instance, Turtle Stitch that our friend Andrea works with here in Vienna, is they took Snap and modified it to work with these embroidery machines. Yeah, cool. So maybe somebody, somebody, maybe Horst can program a new intro sound for the podcast. Yeah. I'm, I'm no sound guy, but for, if you look Not at yet. the Scratch IMS uh, uh, 15, uh, 2015, 
at the website of the conference, the Scratch IMS conference in Amsterdam, there was a talk about extending Scratch. It was from an Italian guy, and it, he, he made it very clear um, how to ex, uh, extend Scratch with your own things, and uh, it's also language agnostic, so you can do it in Python or whatever language you want, because basically, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's XML files. Huh. Uh, maybe I confuse uh, my memory is not so exact, but uh, I will. It will be linked in the show notes. Well, people were really excited about being able to incorporate real-time data from the web in your Scratch projects, mm -hmm. and using things like the voice, the text-to-voice, um, any kind of web APIs. There are web uh, APIs for um, uh, MIDI to. Yeah. I, uh, I tried to use it uh, um, two years ago and um, it didn't work. And uh, then I wrote um, an, an, a process and uh, um, used WebSockets to communicate w uh, the browser with a old um, a synthesizer from the 80s oh. and, uh, and a controller, so a keyboard, and I developed a game. Um, you, uh, this is uh, more complicated than a keyboard and a synthesizer, and uh, but these were, uh, were uh, important parts of the game, and um, it's not possible to play it um, in the internet because um, you need this small server. And uh, some days ago, I read that web uh, MIDI is uh, possible to use in uh, Chrome. Ah. So we, this is very fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it actually interfaces with any MIDI devices, be it yeah. USB or whatever you have yeah. there on your local device. Any MIDI device. And uh, this is a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I will uh, try to uh, rewrote the, the, the library I used to communicate with the uh, um, devices to use web MIDI. Oh. And for music, I know another language PD, pure data. Uh, this is yeah. um, especially for uh, music and sounds. It's uh, based on blocks too, but um, there are connections between the blocks and it's um, not so easy like Scratch, but um, for music it's better. Yeah, I've read a bit about it too. Yeah, it uses PD. like wires, like yeah. nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Which is really intuitive um, access to this kind of, um, mm -hmm. theme, um, of music because you have these um, blocks like machines yeah. and you can draw the lines and so you have an effect uh, machine mm -hmm. and you have a sound machine and you can connect it. I, I never used PT but I used a similar program named Bus Machines mm -hmm. and it was very um, interesting and um, you you can you can accomplish yeah. um, really fast something yeah. good with uh, these programs. Uh, this, um, uh, but you have to work into it because yeah. in, in the machines you have to type in. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, um, it's the easy to program a synthesizer, but it's really hard to uh, program a counter. That's a little complicated, mm. but it's possible. So for doing arpeggios and stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um, I programmed some patches and uh, then I uh, saw that for a counter you can use messages. It's a little bit easier and um, yeah, it's, it's better for music but not so easy for children. And with Scratch, one of the big limitations is that you can't, it's, it's not easy to turn sounds on and off in a, in a quick way. Mm -hmm. So it means you're really just playing as it's almost more like samples versus doing true MIDI or synthesis mm -hmm. yeah. so I want to try that now I want to try it right now like, <laughs> <laughs> my laptop in my bag <laughs> I'm out of okay. topics yeah, yeah no no um, uh, um, yeah look on the <laughs> ich habe noch ein deutsches Thema. <laughs> yes, I will uh, translate. Ja. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, interesting for um, not German speaking persons because uh, um, I talk about he is back. <laughs> er ist wieder da. Ist so viel. 
It's a, it's a movie. Okay. Also es handelt sich dabei um einen Film über Hitler, Adolf Hitler. Dennis talks about a film called uh, He's Back uh, about Adolf Hitler. Um, and, uh, und Adolf Hitler wacht ganz plötzlich uh, 2014 in Berlin in einem Wohngebiet auf. The story is that uh, Adolf Hitler um, somehow awakens uh, 2014 in Berlin. Und um, er wird dabei entdeckt von jemandem. Uh, der findet, dass er ein ganz guter Darsteller um, eines Hitler-Parodisten ist. Uh, he will, is discovered by an uh, agent who, who think this guy is cool to be a player in Hitler uh, double. Uh, <lacht> Derek is vomiting. <lacht> Sorry. Okay, lass okay. Und jeder denkt, dass er eigentlich nur eine, äh, ein Comedian ist und er tritt sogar im Fernsehen auf. So, and, and this uh, Hitler makes a career as a Hitler double in TV and get popular and everyone thinking he's just a Hitler imi intimid imitation. imitation guy, also ja, ja. ein actor. Und ähm, äh, ja, er, also der, dieser Film ist eine Mischung aus Dokumentation, Mockumentary und Komödie. Ah. It's a mix of, of documentary and comedy. Das ist besonders lustig, weil bestimmte Dinge sind nicht gestellt, sondern wirklich ähm, aufgezeichnet worden mit echten Menschen, die auf ihn reagieren. And, and some of those uh, film snippets are real, uh, real life interaction oh, yeah. of non-aware audience uh, with this actor. So it's a documentary how people react to such an actor. You, you should have watched that one instead of The Martian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <lacht> Und jetzt, um Horst zu ärgern, kommt ein Wort, damit, dass er nicht ins Englische übersetzen kann. Donau, Dampfschiff, Agenturs, Kapitänskajüten, Fensterscheibensprung. Uh, and now Dennis is challenging me with my uh, translation skills, but I can't do it. He was referring a long German word, which in English uh, does not exist because you cannot glue together words, so I must, must make a sentence out of it. But he was talking about a ship on the Danube who had a window, and the window had a break. The window was not uh, open. Du hast the And there was some agency. Window, break. <laughs> window breaking agency on the Danube. Yes, something, something like, like that. that. Window breaking agency. <laughs> okay, but then it's about the film. Okay. <laughs> Back to the movie. <laughs> Back to the movie. <clears throat> ja, so gibt es uh, Szenen, in denen uh, Leute mit uh, diesem vermeintlichen Adolf Hitler Selfies machen, inklusive <laughs> Hitler Gruß. <laughs> Oh God, and in this film, uh, people make with this, uh, uh, believed to fa be fake Hitler, make selfies and, and uh, uh, showing the Hitler greeting with the right uh, arm. Oh, oh God. That was the only part I understood, by the way, yeah. what you said. <laughs> Hitler selfies. Yeah. <laughs> for for non-German uh, speaking audience, uh, actually showing a Hitler greeting out of uh, um, out of context, also in the street, uh, not in a theater performance or something. No, no, it's uh, is, is, uh, is on a, the street. Uh, is of, uh, is, um, can be, uh, is illegal. Yeah. yeah. You can get fined for that. Uh, in, uh, in German, uh, in Österreich heißt das Wiederbetätigung. Yeah, yeah. In Deutschland ist es nicht ganz so tragisch ähm, wie in Österreich, weil das fällt zwar unter Wiederbetätigung, aber da es sozusagen nicht ernst gemeint ist, ist es okay. In a satiric uh, way, it's... Yeah, so, so he say in Austria, the uh, laws are even harsher mm -hmm. than in German yeah. for, mm -hmm. for doing that. And, and you have already seen that film? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you liked yesterday. the film? Yesterday. And you liked it? It was in the cinema? Yes, it's... Okay. Uh, um, also der Film ist wirklich grandios, super gespielt um, und sehr empfehlenswert. Uh, Dennis really digs this film. <laughs> and there really is a parallel to The Martian because um, this film... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got it. Oh, there is <laughs> double <laughs> The Martian. <laughs> It's the same actor that dubbed Matt Damon. No, no, no. But um, um, okay. Um, before this film, um, uh, there's, um, this is based always on a very um, popular novel that oh. was written a yeah. few years ago and was um, very well accepted by the mm -hmm. audience. Interesting. Yeah. 
it's really funny and uh, it's really um, good um, acted by the actors and uh, the other people. <laughs> um, uh, you think it would appeal to a non-German audience also? The film would also be interesting for a non-German audience is it, if it's if is it's German humor. Um, or you, you have to know Germany uh, and the German the situation to, to really get the fun. I think it. it's um, I think it's possible to, that English people can um, um, uh, genießen, uh, enjoy. enjoy enjoy the movie yeah. because uh, it's a little bit, but only a little bit like. Um, Uh, Sasha Co uh, Baron Cohen. Goes uh, knees. Okay. Goes knees. Goes knees. Go listen to Thomas. It always makes me think what was the one that just caused a stir last December with. Um, no, no, the one where they go to uh, North Korea. There was also the one uh, like in the back dark side of the moon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know, oh, okay. which I didn't see. I didn't see any of those, but apparently, that's mm -hmm. uh, lots of movies that talk about that kind of topic these days. Yeah, yeah. but you will never see this movie in America the, the because the they the would reproduce yeah, it. The, the moon, uh, so they have. Uh, I think the title the, they, they yeah, wet the dub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so, <laughs> uh, so do you actually like those movies, like German movies, if they actually are? Export it there. Do you just subtitle it? You, you tell us those yes. all, uh, in the last part because we already talked yeah, about Yeah, they this, would the only be subtitled. subtitled. It almost never, I've never seen a German film dubbed. And almost never would a German film be in a movie theater. So only, it would have to be like. Um, a student festival or something? Yeah, well, it, it needs to be. There are only two or three directors that, that it would be, like Vim Vendors. Uh, particularly his documentaries. Documentaries will, will make it into the U.S., but not so much dramatic films. Um, and Herzog, Werner Herzog, like yeah, that, that kind of stuff will. Yeah. So it's just those sort of celebrity foreign directors, mm -hmm. but very rare. Yeah. And there's only a few directors in each country. Same with France. Only a few directors, like Leos Carax maybe would be in. Like Holy Rollers was, was the last film of his that made it mainstream mm -hmm. in the US but they make no money and that they'd, they'd only be in a major city so if you don't live in New York Chicago LA San Francisco you never even hear of these films like yeah which is so sad because yeah. in, in, in past times there was a um, really um, vital cooperation between Europe um, film and America film. There were American actors here, European actors. I remind on Romy Schneider who acted on very um, many films, uh, but better um, the Donald Sutherland who yeah. filmed with Federico Fellini and yeah. so on. And this, well, Fantastic movies. Yeah, and Nicholson and Antonioni and yeah, and, and the directors would also go back and forth. They could do English language and then go back to their native language, and we don't really have that now. Yeah, this is very. It should be supported. So. Yeah, and we should. I think we might have mentioned it last time, or maybe it was after the podcast. But obviously, you should watch uh, Hercules in New York, where they actually dubbed. Leave Arnold right now. <laughs> what actually dubbed Arnold Schwarzenegger into English? Oh, Schwarzenegger. Because <laughs> 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 his English wasn't so good back then. Yeah. Uh, at, at least here you can buy a DVD oh, where you get three audio tracks. One where he has his original English language, <laughs> which kind of sounds fun. Then he dubbed in English and everything dubbed into German. Yeah. Uh, so they even don't let him speak his own German voice? No. Uh, I'm not sure. Do they dub him? Um, German, the early the, uh, movies the were dubbed, uh, uh, not dubbed, but uh, the, he speaks his German. Uh, but uh, the uh, current, uh, it's impossible. Nev uh, uh, nobody can understand him in German anymore. <laughs> did he do it in the beginning? Uh, and I did he did he dub himself in the beginning? I remember that Hercules was. Um, <laughs> Dubbed, but, uh, not dubbed in English and not dubbed in German. Uh, um, uh, so it's dubbed by himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, this uh, um, low budget film, uh, movies. So I didn't know that he did a Hercules because Lou Ferrigno is also in a famous low budget Hercules film. And of course, they're both 
were together in what was the, the documentary that, that kind of launched both of their careers. Um, like, I can't remember what it was now, but there's a documentary about their bodybuilding competition. I, um, um, pumping Iron. I yeah, know, yeah, Pumping Iron, yeah. yeah. Basic. <laughs> yeah, which is cool. So they could, have, they could have had dueling Hercules too. Like. <laughs> yeah, like he was if you're into the, the such trashy face of uh, Schwarzenegger, um, um, I can also mm, not mm -hmm. recommend, but I can say there exists uh -huh. a film named Cactus Jack. It's a western with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Kirk Douglas. Oh. Yes. I thought you were going to say... Willem. Oh. Ah, I thought you were going to say Kirk Cameron. I, could do, I, I would pay to see a Western with, with Kirk Cameron and, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Like, growing pains in the Terminator. <laughs> so the good and the bad actor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is which? Yeah. 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 In this movie, it's... Uh, watch it. Or not. <laughs> Mm. Other topics? Yes. yes. Yeah. I think. Oh. Are we already at high score time wise? Absolutely. For our second English podcast, we Seven now reached uh, one hour and something, and two minutes. Is and that we the longest Peter Hour podcast that we had so far? No, no. And we still have the uh, seven interview minutes of interview. Uh, <laughs> if you want to have uh, topics, I have some topics. Okay, that was wonderful. <laughs> well, enjoy, enjoy the interview with Anna about mm -hmm. Robo Wunderkind. Yeah. And um, uh, if you uh, prefer us uh, in the German language, head over to biertaucher.at. Mm -hmm. um, and if you Where enjoy... You the of this podcast. <laughs> By Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> If you enjoy us with our strong uh, English accents uh, speaking English, uh, head over to internationalopenmagazine.org where you will uh, soon find our Is magazine. Is it actually possible to register such a long domain name? Yeah, I already did. Okay. Okay. CEUs like me. <laughs> so you also... Uh, I'm, I'm also I found Open Mag is available, so we'll, we'll have a shorter one too. Okay. But now you can. Goodbye. 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 11 October 2015, I'm speaking with Anna from Project Wunderkind. Robo Wunderkind. Robo Wunderkind. Yes. Hello, Anna. Hi, Horst. Um, Anna, can you tell me about yourself, about the group of people mm -hmm. you are? And what your project is? Okay, so we are three co-founders, and like we've been working on this project since two years. Uh, so we set off uh, on a mission to create a robot which any child can build and program. And like we came up with the idea that we want uh, building robots to be as simple as playing with Lego bricks. So what we developed, it's um, uh, it's bricks with electronics inside, and by snapping these bricks together, kids built a robot, which they can later on program in an app on smartphone or tablets. And for so stamping the bricks together, I don't need wire and, and glue or something. Exactly. Like yeah. Lego sticks, uh, Lego bricks. Stick. Yeah, so it's so it's, it's just like normal mechanical connection, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's what something we put a lot of effort into it to, so that to eliminate wires, uh, because it's something which scares people a bit and still like you have like just simple bricks but these are like really sophisticated elements because they have a lot of uh, like electronic components and like it's also Lego compatible so kids build your robot and then they can actually build on top of it a lot of stuff with like Lego bricks and, and you have yeah. bricks, with, uh, bricks with different functionality like a camera brick uh, yes a exactly so there are different colors, and each mm -hmm. color stands for a certain uh, function. So, oh, okay. for example, like red brick, it's um, ultrasonic sensor. Mm -hmm. Then we have blue ones, which are motors. Mm -hmm. Orange one is microcontroller, and it has also microphone and speakers. Then the one with batteries, with Bluetooth module, infrared sensor. And then mm -hmm. we actually have, uh, because we have three different sets, and the bigger ones has have also accelerometer, mm -hmm. LED display, uh, temperature sensor, um, weather sensor, and even digital camera. <laughs> and uh, you have shown in your video uh, you have created an app so that you can co uh, visual programming for children uh, yeah. these robots that you build with them without a line of code. Yes. So, um, like the, f the our programming interface, it's visual and it even, like, it's it basically symbols which stand for actions. 
this is like the like the very first uh, level. Then like kids which can uh, become more like confident with coding, they can start doing it in Scratch. So we'll also integrate Scratch with our robot. And then we are actually thinking of uh, um, giving a possibility to program robot in Python. <laughs> Yeah, that's our like. Yeah, that's something we're gonna work this on. This is not done yet. This is, uh, it's not uh, yet. So now we're on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and we have like our next strategy goal is. Uh, so we raised so far one hundred ninety thousand, and our next strategy goal is three hundred. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. So with, with three hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. dollars, we want to make an open library of three D mm -hmm. printed accessories for robot, Very so good. so that people can upload their designs, designs or download yeah. someone's designs, make something with it, print it at home with three D printer, and use. Yeah. It with a robot. You sell the robot bricks as a set, or can I specifically uh, uh, buy two camera modules? Or so? Yeah, so uh, on Kickstarter we, send, we sell them as three sets, but of mm. course later on we will be selling additional mm. modules. Mm. Uh, can you, uh, can, do you know already about the license? Uh, have you an open hardware license or open software license for, for your software? Uh, so, Scratch is is open source and we provide also an API. We will yeah. provide an API for, for people. Uh, and yeah. Like the, the code, like the visual programming mm -hmm. interface is, is going to be ours. It's uh, remain closer. Yes. And the uh, design of your bricks themselves, are they patented? Or we, we, yeah, we patented the, mm -hmm. the connection okay. system. Yes, but like with the, uh, we believe that with this 3D printed accessories, which will be like all yeah. open, uh, yeah, people will be able to build on, on top of it. Print, uh, 3D print my own robots. Um, it's so actually it will be. The thing what I, buy from you, I like think I no, I think like you people like who can do that, they would be able to build something, but it mm. won't be. In order for us to make it easy for people to do that it's going to be quite a lot of effort because you we uh, um yeah it's you know like we're putting electronics inside mm -hmm. the cubes and it's everything is quite uh, like sophisticated do you have an official <laughs> um, cooperation with lego because yes. you say you have yes. a lego competition yes. uh, no we don't like it's uh what is actually cool lego patents expired so now everybody can use uh, this kind of so we are not like we're not allowed to say we copy Lego, we're just like we are Lego compatible, and that's what we're doing. Um, how? Um, what was the inspiration of doing using um, in cooperation to the existing systems like the Lego Mindstorm robot? Or there are several robot yeah. kits out there. Yeah. So we looked at them and mm -hmm. like what we wanted to do we wanted to to create a robot for younger kids mm -hmm. because lego mindstorms is 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 a really cool robot mm -hmm. but it's not an easy entry like the kids yeah. can't just start playing with it like they need either a lot of guidance or they need something before and we wanted a robot which even like a 5 year child a child could so start really playing with to, to start in with start. yeah okay. but of course like it's because of scratch and scratch yeah. is more exciting and, and and then, because we have like two different sets, which are also like have, have a mm. lot of functions, we notice that even parents buy it sometimes for themselves because it just yeah, yeah. it's you know if you have like digital camera in a robot, like you can come up with quite a lot of <laughs> what you, you could do. With you that. experience how kids or should kids interact with the robots? Did you make some test one with uh, your yeah. in shoes? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we actually we had already uh, three different designs, and like they were, we changed them because we were like testing them with mm -hmm. kids and like seeing what what works best. Uh, so like our yeah we, like the the design we have now we believe is really good. Um, like also we continue testing the integration of app with robot because mm -hmm. it's also okay. so, something super important because of course building is it's very important part of like you the kids build your robot. And then they program a robot they build themselves. Mm -hmm. So they see how this robot comes yeah. to life with coding. Uh, but of course, so building has to be very intuitive, but then coding is also a very important part, and this is what we are continuously doing. And have you experienced how the kids interact with the robots? So they like them from first time, but they, they need a teacher to explain to them that this is a robot? Uh, you know, actually, like, yeah, it depends on, on, on children, because it's like there are also like there are some children which are very like comfortable with technology, mm -hmm. and there are some which need need a bit of like help but our robot is also very colorful so it's mm -hmm. something like actually kids like I kind of like also maybe it's a bit of like Lego association mm -hmm. these colorful bricks what you should do with them you snap them together mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny sometimes like you have to explain them like to give them some guidance that if you want wheels to be driving like they have to be parallel and not mm -hmm. in some yeah. funny 
<laughs> combination, but it's also kind of like experimentation, which is like a good learning effect for kids to like which combinations of robots are like viable and which are just like for fun. <laughs> Do you know where the bricks will be produced? Yeah, they they produce in China. So last mm-hmm. year we were part of Hardware Accelerator Hacks, mm-hmm. and we spent almost half a year in Shenzhen, China, working mm-hmm. on organizing manufacturing. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, to support you, you would love that people go to your Kickstarter page. Exactly. What so is the, the best web page to, to visit your project? So um, uh, go to startrobo.com mm-hmm. or just Google Robo Wunderkind mm-hmm. on from Kickstarter. Wunderkind is a German name. You, you, yeah, uh, so we'll. That, um, isn't that uh, hurting your global marketing? Um, not really, like it's been recognized also in the English speaking mm-hmm. realm. Uh, area uh, English speaking countries and like we liked Wunderkind because it's it's a combination of like Wunderkind and genius and we believe mm-hmm. that every child is a genius and also it's like a wonder kid like a, a small wonder so we just liked it a combination of a genius and a small wonder which is in every child and we believe that like if we introduce kids at an early age technology we mm-hmm. give them a lot of possibilities mm-hmm. and open and totally new world and they could do some amazing things with it. <laughs> Can you shortly uh, speak uh, how, how you met the other guys of the project? And, uh, so you said yeah. you were all from the studying in Vienna? Or living so in Vienna? I was living, like the guy I came to study, I also came to study to Vienna, uh, I was already done with my studies and like I, I, we basically all met at Pioneers Festival, which is like a huge startup yeah. event in Vienna. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny that like we're a very international team, but we all met in Vienna. So now he, that's the place where we are based, okay. our home base. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you.